Good morning, church. I'm so glad you're here. Let me ask you something. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Teleport? Teleport? Yeah, good. Okay, that was fast. Anybody want to fly? Yeah, right, right. Anybody want to be invisible? Like forever? People on the back row, right? Of course, right? That's, when I come and visit a church, that's where I sit too. No shame there. What if I told you, don't groan, don't roll your eyes, what if I told you that gratitude was a superpower? Oh, somebody gets it. What if I told you that thankfulness is actually a superpower, especially in the world we find ourselves today, where we have short fuses, no grace, <laughs> and everybody's mad. Everybody's angry, especially on the road. You know, full confession. I'm working on it, okay? I'm working on it. There's a big holiday coming up where apparently it's culturally acceptable for most people in the world to give a nod to God, and a little tip of the hat, maybe, maybe say a prayer, maybe cut a giant bird up. And there's nothing wrong with being thankful. And stuff. I think we should do that, but I'm wondering if we're selling God just a wee bit short when we relegate it to just one day a year. Maybe as Christians, it's time we move a little bit past that. God is worthy of so much more. So what if I told you that having this attitude of gratitude can change your life for the better? We're going to see that in just a minute. There is so much truth in what God's Word has to say. When we're done, you might actually agree that gratitude is a superpower. God desires for us to live a life of thanksgiving every day, overflowing with gratitude. No matter what kind of day we're having, no matter what comes our way, we're supposed to spend our days in a celebration of gratitude and worship to Him. And I know the first time you hear that, you may say, Pastor, that is a rough thing to do. And I get it, especially what some of us have been through these last couple years. You may not wake up feeling, I'm so ready to be grateful today. I get it. That's what, you're in the right place. It's the potter's hand, man. We can relax, take our masks, and we don't have to pretend to be anything. We're just sons and daughters of the king. We have a seat at the table, and today his word is going to speak so powerfully. We're going to break this down verse by verse. Look at Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be verse 6 and 7. We're going to hit this pretty much word for word, okay? In this short passage, you're going to see how to live a life that is abounding in thanksgiving. He says this, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. Wow, there's so much gold there. In this short passage, we're going to see how Christians can live a life of thanksgiving if, and this is the big if, we're willing to do what he says. This is your part. If we're truly willing, he is going to outline four truths right here that will change your life. If we're willing to do this, not only will you live every day in gratitude, not every day, not, not only will you be blessed, but you will glorify God. It is that double whammy, that win-win. Paul says in that first part, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. All right, so our first truth is right there. I am obligated to obedience. I am obligated to obedience. Now, this is not some heavy-handed, guilt-ridden obedience. It's not anything slavish. This is out of gratitude. If we truly want to be sold out, if we want to be all in, disciples of the Lord Jesus, then obedience is is not optional. I know that's not politically correct to say. I know that's not popular. Obedience is not, say that with me. Obedience is not optional. I hope you catch that. We are obligated to obedience. We see that right here in these three words, walk in him. Did you catch that? Look at that verse, walk in him. It is a declarative statement. That means we follow him. We walk in his footprints. We have faithful obedience. Y'all remember that great story? about the boy, and his father was, was just addicted to strong drink and just couldn't break it. And every night after he thought his son was in bed, he would slip out the door and he would walk a couple blocks down to the nearest bar, and the wife would just cry. One night, he was walking and the snow had begun to fall, and he sensed somebody was behind him. And as he turned around, he saw his six-year-old son struggling to stay in his giant footsteps. And anger reared up in the dad, and actually he said, what are you doing out of bed? Why are you here? This is not safe. Go back. What are you doing? He said, dad, I'm safe. I'm just following in your footsteps. He ran, picked up his son, 
changed his life. When he saw the impact of walking in footsteps. God is saying, look at my son. Walk in his footsteps. Look at, be like him, right? Walk in obedience. For the Christ follower, we are supposed to be all in. Not out of guilt, not out of shame, not out of some heavy-handed compulsion, but out of gratitude for all God has done. We just sang about it. Break the strongholds. He is the one that delivered us. He is the one that not only gave us eternity in heaven, but abundant life now. So out of gratitude, out of thankfulness, I am going to gladly, humbly obligate myself to be obedient and follow his direction and will for my life. How are you doing with that? Look at Jesus' words here in Matthew 28, part of the Great Commission. He says, teaching them to observe all that I have moderately suggested to them. Oh, yours doesn't say that? What's that word? Commanded you. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Without going through a long list of every command Jesus ever gave in the Bible, we can obey all of them simply by using Jesus as our role model, simply by letting him be our guide. Jesus asks us to obey. He's asking us to become like him. Now, here's the good part. He's not asking us to become like him, to be a burden. It's not with rules. It's not regulations. It's not some legalistic, pharisaical journey. It is full of grace. He teaches us how to truly live a life that is filled with abundance. That is awesome. See, when I live in obedience to Christ, I am simply following the owner's manual, right? I got my, my 20-year-old beater pickup truck out there. I'd bring you the owner's manual, show you, but I can't find it. It's going to cross 300,000 miles in the next month or so. I, I hope. I hope it holds up. The owner's manual is what has made it last this long. Doing faithful oil changes, letting Freddie do his magic maintenance that he does for half of you two. God's word is the same thing. When I am following the owner's manual for my life, I am, create, I, am, I am being who he created me to be, this, this finely tuned piece of automotive machinery you see in front of you, this, this Ferrari, right? All right, maybe it's a 72 Oldsmobile Cutlass, but those were pretty sweet, you got to admit, in their day, they were awesome. This finely tuned machine, God has made you. This finely tuned machine, he has purposed you, he has given you an owner's manual, and when we follow that, we achieve God's best because he knows what I need spiritually, relationally, professionally. He knows what's best for me. And when I follow what's best, then I am doing what I was created to be. I'm able to function at a higher level. My gratitude for God grows because he hasn't burdened me. He's not laid me down. Rather, he's given me the keys to the Ferrari. Does that make sense? He's given me keys to freedom. You remember how it felt when you got your first car? Oh, mine was a black 86 Jeep Comanche. They don't even make them anymore. Y'all remember your first car, don't you? Yeah, because it was magical. It was special. It was the one time in your life you didn't mind running errands. Right? Your parents would be like, oh, man, we're out of milk and eggs. You're like, what's that? I'll go get it, Mom. Right? And you would run down. You'd drive Dad's 86 Cutlass Sierra GT. Right? Anyone else? No? Just me? Okay. And we go down the mountain, and we come back with just milk. Mom would be like, where's the eggs? I'm like, oh, did I forget those? Be back, right? And you go run the extra errand because you didn't mind. You were so excited because we were living this incredible freedom. When we understand that obedience to Christ is a benefit and a blessing and not a burden, you will walk in a new level of joy and spiritual gratitude and maturity. A little earlier in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus reveals a secret. You ready for this? Check this out. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Are you living that way? And there are days where it's a struggle to realize God's yoke is not burdensome, but it's light because I'm living in my purpose. The promise he's making is that by imitating Jesus in our obedience, his commands become less burdensome, not more. And the end result of this is he's glorified. Again, this is a win-win, baby. This is, this is a classic twofer, all right? The next truth, if I'm serious about being a disciple, then I'm going to be dedicated to development. It's where the rubber hits the road. Okay, this is your part. Gordon McDonald tells this great story about when he first ran track in high school. See, Colossians 2 says, be rooted and built up in him. And evidently, the coach saw something great in him, some, some greatness and they said, listen, I want to invite you over to my house. You're starting to recruit him. Bring your family, and we're going to talk. 
And after dinner, he gave him a notebook with his name on the notebook. And he said, I want to show you something. Come over here and sit next to me. And he opened up this notebook and he turned, it was weird, he turned to the very end of the notebook. And he went all the way through these pages and he said, Gordon, I want to show you something. Notice the date here at the very end. It's over three and a half years away. The summer, June, three and a half years away. And he said, Gordon, look here. These are all the races that I'm going to schedule you to run for the next four years. Gordon's eyes grew a little wide. He said, now look closer. These are all the times that you're going to achieve in those races. And Gordon looked at those times. He said, sir, you're crazy. That is light years faster than I've ever run. I'm not anywhere close to that. And then the coach said, I know, but check this out. And he began to go backwards, turning the pages backwards one by one and saying, I want you to see this. Over the next 42 months, you are going to see that I have planned out and scheduled a gradual workout that is accelerating and increasing your skill and your speed. So in the months and years to come, you are going to be everything you were created to be. Are you catching this? The coach was dedicated to his development. He had a plan. He was intentional about it. He just didn't leave it up to chance or happenstance. He had a development plan ready to go for his athletic growth. Why should it be any different for us with our spiritual growth? But we take so many things more seriously. Our financial chart, our health chart, our sporting chart. Why would it be any less important to chart out what God has for you and me? If we are dedicated to becoming disciples of Christ, this has to be number one. This has to be the highest thing. We think. Remember, development and maturity in Christ is not optional, and it is not accidental. Spiritual growth doesn't just happen. Right? Mom, dad, grandparents, your kids, your grandkids will not grow closer to Christ by accident. You must be intentional. You have to surround them with like-minded believers as much as possible. Expose them to God's truth as often as you can. We'll help you out with this. We'll give you a head start. Three and a half hours every week exposing them to God's truth. Right? When they come, 9.15 on Sundays, 10.30, two hours right there. On Wednesday, another hour and a half at 6.30. Expose them to this. I tell you what, what they're being exposed to out in the world is not bringing them closer to Christ. We've got a limited window that we counteract all the lies of the enemy. This is it. You and us, this is it. We are the ones. The lost world is going to try so hard to squeeze them into its mold. And that mold is not one that brings them closer to Christ. All right, so what if God had a notebook with your name on it? Well, he does. And what if he came to you and he said, hey, guys, listen, this is where you can be spiritually in five years if you follow this plan. If you are committed to your discipleship, when we read his word on a regular basis, when we seek his face in prayer, when we fellowship, we worship with other like-minded believers, we begin to serve and not just soak. We begin to teach others everything we've learned and share the good news. All of these activities lead to developing as a disciple. At every stage of development, God is there, just like your coach. He's cheering you on. Whoa, yeah, he's your biggest cheerleader. That's awesome. Way to go, Lawrence. Yeah. Keep it up, Ellie. You're doing great, Rob. Woo, he's cheering you on. He's, he's cheering. He is your biggest cheerleader. God is so pleased when we are living a life that is rooted and built up in him, abounding in thanksgiving, becoming the person he created you to be. God provides what we need on his end. You know what he's waiting for? Our obedient heart, one that is dedicated to our development. So you know I got to ask, how you doing with that? How dedicated would you say you are to your spiritual development? Are you doing your portion? His burdens are light. His yoke is easy. It's no, no problem there. But we meet him, and then he supplies the rest. Are you willing to say, God, I'm going to follow your growth track that you've laid out in your notebook because I want to be the person you've made me to be. There comes a point in our lives where we have to quit playing games with God, and we got to get down to business. Time is short. One of you sent me a a great meme a couple weeks ago. It was so funny. You may remember the NC State game 
when they were playing Maryland, and it, it was not going that well, and they, uh, they were getting a little chippy, let's just say. And after the tackles, there was some stuff going on under the dog piles that you're not supposed to see. And Finally, the, the ref <laughs> made one of the most classic calls ever. When he blew his whistle, threw the flag, he said, personal foul, number 69, offense. He was giving him the business. <laughs> Y'all remember that? And even the commentators on TV were like, what? What, is, what kind of penalty is that? He was giving him the business? It was so profound. That was perfect. Guys, there comes a time in our lives where we got to quit giving God the business and get down to business. We got to be serious. The little boy's got to sit down. And the man has to stand up. We got to get off the bench, get in the game, whatever metaphor you want to use, so that we are abounding in thanksgiving. God is calling us to the next level. He is looking for hearts who are fully his, who are devoted, all in, 100%, fully devoted to be disciples of Jesus. If I'm serious about that, then next, I'm cultivating my convictions. I'm nourishing them. I'm fanning them in the flame. Colossians 2 says to be established in the faith, just as you were taught. All right, so here we move from God, what he wants us to do, to now the results, what it's going to be if I'm faithful, if I do these. In other words, God says he wants me to be obedient to him and develop my faith, but then he tells me the part that he's going to play. God shows me how to be obedient by pointing to Jesus, and he's saying, walk in him. Be like him. Just do that. Just be him, right? It's not, don't worry about anybody else. You don't have to be like Oprah. You don't have to be like anybody else. Just be like Jesus. Just follow after him. Walk in his footsteps like that little boy in the snow. See, something incredible happens when we allow God to take over. He comes and he gives us the encouragement and the conviction of faith that reminds me, I'm on the right track. And when we gather together, we hear a whisper, you're not alone. You're not the only one who believes. Even though, as you see the great falling away happening before our eyes, there will also be simultaneously a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to see like-minded believers knowing each other, standing together, linking arms. I got your back. The Spirit recognizes the Spirit. You see it. You sense it when you're out at, at the dinner table and your server comes up. You can tell if they know the Lord. Immediately, there's something that connects. You can also tell if they don't, and your heart aches. You see the pain and the lostness behind their eyes. God gives us that encouragement to be like Jesus, and it affects the way you think, and it starts to affect the way you feel, the way you act, and hopefully the way you react. Even behind the road, on the, on the road, sitting there behind the wheel in your sweet 72 Cutlass. That's where real maturity comes in. Where God takes what I was, and he makes me what I'm supposed to be. He takes my disbelief, and he replaces it with faith. He takes my weakness and replaces it with his strength when I linger in his presence. One of the greatest things he does is he takes away my gullible acceptance of falsehoods that are everywhere, and he replaces them with truth. See, something happens. When you start standing on truth, you start seeing lies of the devil, and you can expose them say, that's not true. Hey, baby, listen, daughter, that standard of beauty is a lie. Hey, son, that standard of athleticism, that's not what you live for. That's a lie. What's important is what will last. It's Jesus. It's living for him. It's taking as many people with us as we can when we come and stand before him. If you really want to pay attention, you'll start seeing the world in a whole new way. Some of you, you said your eyes have been open these last few years. You've seen things. God has taken you deeper. It's almost like he is allowing a return to, to a childlike faith, a sense of awe and wonder and a sense of, of deep gratitude for the Lord. One of the, one of the greatest illustrations I can think of for this, a place I'd love to return to, that, that sense of excitement. My favorite memory that illustrates this is when my oldest daughter, Marin, I think she was maybe five or six, and we were visiting Mama, my mom, up in St. Louis before her health started to turn. And I remember being with Amy, and we were inside the house, and it was really quiet, and I said, uh-oh, where's Marin? <laughs> and then what really scared me was, where's Mama? <laughs> where's Mama? What are they up to? We looked around the house, didn't see them. We went out back, and guess where they were? We found them. They were playing in the mud, 
up to their chins in mud. Had a garden hose, and they were laughing, having such a good time. And I tell you what, as an adult, as a father, what's the first reaction we have, right? I come running out, no, 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 what are you doing? Oh, you're going to, you know, so what do we see? We see dirty carpets, dirty clothes, mud everywhere, and you can't get in the car. What are you, what are you thinking? And then I stopped, and I looked, and I'm like, childlike wonder. Play on, little girl. And I remember God's admonition to us. Let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. This is it. This takes you back. This frees you. This takes all the load off your shoulders. Remember, his yoke is easy. His burdens are light on us. To cultivate my convictions, you start to see things the way God made them. He takes over our life and allows us to return to this kingdom mindset that we had as a child where he spoke and we obeyed. He said, go do this, and we did it. We have that level of obedience, that adventure, that sense of fun and wonder. I wonder if we could be so confident in God that we're free of all the lies and deceptions and we just live for him. He takes us back to that childlike state of innocence, that all oh, Don't you want to go back there? God is going to restore all this. We begin to sing praise to him out of the simplicity and the joy and the wonder of it all. When you cut away all the trappings and everything and you get back to the core, Jesus plus nothing equals purpose. It's all about living for him. It leads us to our last truth. When that happens, I am proclaiming his praise. I am proclaiming his praise. Colossians 2 verse 7 finishes with those three words. May you be abounding in thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. It means overflowing. We have any, any nurses that work? Any nurses among us? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, see a few nurses? God bless you. <laughs> you guys are awesome. I just read this week about a story from Nancy Ortberg, who was a nurse. She'd worked for several years, and she writes this. She says, one of my earliest patients was a young girl, about 14 years old, who had been in a terrible dirt bike accident. You hear this, Milo? Okay. I met this young girl down in the physical therapy department. She was sitting in one of our Whirlpool therapy baths, and I had read her chart upstairs before I came down to work with her, and I'd learned that as a result of the accident, her leg had been amputated just below the knee. I couldn't imagine what it must be like to be 14 years old and have part of your leg missing. So I approached her, I introduced myself, we made some small talk, and through the course of our time together, I learned that she was a follower of Christ. She was a Christian. But what I was not prepared for was her incredible, beautiful spirit. Especially when she surprised me by suddenly raising her newly amputated leg above the bubbling water for me to see. And she excitedly said, look how much I have left. Wow. Look how much I have left. With childlike innocence and joy. She excitedly told me that since the doctors were able to amputate below the knee, it was going to be much easier for them to fit a prosthesis. And now she was excited and ready to get on with the rehab. And how much longer would it be before she could get started with that? She went on to talk for several minutes, but I didn't hear much of what she said because I was focused on those words. Look how much I have left. Her gratitude was so genuine. It wasn't denial wasn't Pollyannish. She knew exactly what had happened. She was missing a good part of her leg, and she would have never chosen this. But, you ready for this, Christian? She was so thankful for any good news, her spirit made my spirit soar that day. And I had two good legs. Then I remembered Hebrews 12, 28 that says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken... Let us be thankful and so worship God. And there it is. Out of gratitude, we worship God. She finishes with these two sentences. That day in the hospital, the gratitude of a 14-year-old girl profoundly changed me. Our gratitude and thankfulness is a way in which we worship God. One of my goals in life is to be like that girl, is to have that level of inspiring, incredible gratitude in the middle of awful circumstances. 
What a lesson. It's so easy to give thanks when things are going good. So easy to, to say, hey, God, this is great. I thank you for this and that. What matters is how we react in the down times no matter where we find ourselves. See, that's the mature faith. Look at the faith of this girl. Look how she's already inspiring people. Hundreds of miles later in a town called Apex, a girl we will never meet this side of glory. She's already changing lives. Y'all, that is a mature faith that is abounding with thanksgiving. Paul's talking about this. He's not saying give thanks for the nice car. He's not saying thank you so much for this incredible fat turkey I'm about to eat not saying thank you even for my job or the family. All those things are great. He's talking instead about living a life that is so filled with the goodness of God that we involuntarily overflow into every area of our life. What we see, what we say, what we do, what we think, that is the result of living a life of obedience. And when the storms come, and they will, we stand firm. Because we are abounding with things. And we are literally overflowing into every area of our life. That's a result of living a life of obedience. Of being willing to disciple ourselves. Going into this development. Cultivating that growth that Paul talks about. So my question is, how serious are you about that? How serious am I about that? In just a few days, all of us are going to sit down to probably a great Thanksgiving dinner. We're going to spend time with family and friends. We're going to see family we haven't... We haven't had Thanksgiving with in years. We're probably going to say a prayer to God, tell him how grateful we are. Probably going to laugh a lot, probably watch Alabama lose another football game. It's okay. I can handle it. Out of the overflow of gratitude. Everything is good to say those prayers and stuff, but guys, I wonder if this is the year that God is calling his church deeper. Is he is challenging me personally to move beyond a day of Thanksgiving to living a life of thanksgiving, where people see us and they say, there is something different about you. We say, it's not me, it's the Lord Jesus. Just as we saw, I'm one beggar telling another where I found free food. It's already been paid for. Will you listen to it? Can I talk to you about Jesus? I hope we can move from a day of thanksgiving to a life of thanksgiving to the one who gave everything for us. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to end a little different. I'm going to pray for us, but I want to challenge you with a few things. Over these next few weeks, you're going to hear the gospel laid out. Believe it or not, Advent is coming up. We're going to walk through the Christmas story. We're going to share on a great granular level what it means to follow Christ. Will you pray about inviting somebody? Maybe you've been following Christ for years and you've never stepped out in baptism. We're going to be baptizing in a couple weeks. Will you come talk to me about that? Maybe it's time to take that step of obedience. The very first thing we're called to do after accepting Christ, repent and be baptized. Maybe God's calling you even deeper to take a huge step of faith and go overseas. Will you pray about that? If you have questions about going overseas, going to Ghana, will you see Pastor Bill? He's right over here on the second row if you've never met him. Awesome guy. Go spend some time with him. Ask him your questions. God is doing great things every year as we mission endeavor in Ghana. Next week, we are having a Deck the Halls party. This is going to be our chance to drag, redecorate everything. We have to do it this week because the following week, Advent starts. Can you believe that? The 27th is Advent. That is when we redecorate everything. We're going to have a party here next week. Priscilla's got cookies. We're going to have the Christmas music playing. If you hate Christmas music, you might want to bring earplugs because we play in it. And we're going to have a great time, and we're going to rejuvenate this room, and we're going to pray over it and make it an awesome place that is, that is ready to present the gospel that comes at Christmas time. I hope you will come to that. All right? I'm going to pray for you as we issue the challenge. Would you stand with me? We'll be dismissed with this because I want to respect your time, and I've used all up. My challenge for you this week is this. May you be so filled with God's goodness that it overflows into every area of your life that it affects this week what you say, what you hear, what you think, how you act, and how you react. May we be seen as disciples of the Lord Jesus when we leave. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for your challenge today. I thank you for your spirit in this room, encouraging, convicting, challenging us. 
Lord, as we leave this place, would you give us a boldness, a newness, a, a, a joy in our step as we go, as we point people to you. Lord, we pray again for that weekly divine appointment. Put somebody in our path that we can share the good news. May we point people to you. May we be found grateful with hearts that overflow with gratitude for all you've done. You are so good. We worship you. That's our prayer as we go. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen and amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a great week. See you Wednesday night.